This is Adnan Zarana 24. Tonight, this far the growth of connectivity and many people using the internet than any other time in history. Sri Lanka seems to be on the brink of another disaster as an impending calamity is rising its ugly head in the form of hate speech. What happens online leaks its way through the society where people exchange their viewpoints, often ending in violence. This is not a problem only for Sri Lanka but seems like there's a less of a solution in the world despite many attempts by the government to curb hate speech seems like the only effective solution thus far is pulling the plug and sending the country towards social media blackout is this the only solution we are left with tonight our panel to discuss this is professor rohan samarajiva chairman of information and communication technology agency also known as icta and yudanjana vijayaratna who is a researcher at learn asia Welcome to Monday. Let's talk something weird. Welcome everyone to a brand new program by all of us here at Other Than 24. From tonight onwards, every Monday, we will be on the air at 7 p.m. with this new program called Get Real. Why the name Get Real? Well, there was some candid discussion with several of my colleagues and the reason is there's so much noise that's out there pertaining to various subjects. Lots of people shouting at each other. They are mostly talking at each other and not trying to understand as to what each of us are saying. Less facts and more noise. That's where we want to make a change. This program invites you to get real with the facts, get real with the reality, and of course, get real with the truth. All right, this week we want to focus on an issue that seems to be very familiar for all of us, hate speech. Whether we are on Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, Twitter or whatnot, some of us would have been subjected towards hate in the form of words coming at us absolutely for no reason and purely based on the way we look, what we believe and where we come from. On a daily basis, even several of our journalists face the same fate even when they engage in reporting the news. So the question is, what is hate? speech. The Merriam-Webster dictionary spells it out very short and sweet, simply saying speech expressing hatred for a particular group of people. With that, the question is, where does free speech end and hate speech begins? This question has been one that many intellectuals are trying to find a definition, hence the translation seems to be getting in the way. For an example, the government of Sri Lanka will say that any statement targeting minority groups are not allowed. Some might argue that it hinges on the right for free speech. Now, in the world over, like in France, social media giants such as Facebook and Twitter would be required to remove any hateful content within 24 hours under a draft bill approved by the France's National Assembly. Now, accountability seems to be one of the questions that needs to be addressed, and companies like Facebook are called out at each time when things go wrong, mainly because they didn't do enough to take control of the situation. Take a look at this report from our nightly news first at night, where Facebook Facebook admitted that they knew well in hand that its platform is being used to incite hate and violence. Facebook says that the company realized long before this year's deadly attack in Sri Lanka that Facebook was being used to amplify ethnic and religious tensions. Testifying at Justice Committee hearing into online hate, Head of Public Policy for Facebook Canada Kevin Chan has said that the company knew as early as 2018 that its platform was being used to incite division and violence. Chang said, quote, with regards to the tragedy in Sri Lanka, we know that the misuse and abuse of our platform may amplify underlying ethnic and religious tensions and contribute to offline harm in some parts of the world. This is especially true in countries like Sri Lanka, where many people are using the internet for the first time and social media can be used to spread hate and fuel tension on the ground, unquote. CBC News, however, highlights that Chan's comments to be in contrast to the company's response last week to questions from the International Grand Committee in Ottawa about the role Facebook played in the events that led up to the attack in Sri Lanka. It said that when questioned about videos that appeared on Facebook in Sri Lanka six months before the attacks, which were flagged to the company, urging people to kill non-Muslims, including women and children, Global Policy Director Neil Potts defended Facebook's sanctions. He is quoted saying that when Facebook are made aware of such content, the company removes it. 
Potts has however said that if it is not reported or if Facebook has not proactively identified it, then company would not remove it because they do not know it's there. Well, let's discuss more on this subject. And today, my colleague Anrabha Hera joins our esteemed panel for an in-depth discussion. To get a little bit more perspective on this topic that we are talking about tonight, we have two guests who are at the forefront of the specific issue that we are talking about, which is hate speech on social media. Our first guest tonight is Professor Rohan Samarajiva, who is the chairman of the Information and Communication Technology Agency of Sri Lanka, otherwise known as ICTA. And the other guest we have is Yudanjia Vijayaratna, who is a researcher at Learn Asia, uh, working specifically on big data, as I understand. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, thank you both very much for joining us on the show uh, this evening. So to get started, uh, before we go on to the very specifics of the online aspect of hate speech, I wanted to start off with the challenges that we face about defining hate speech itself. Um, of course, we know that what hate speech is to one person might not be hate speech to another person. Uh, Professor, if I could start with you, in terms of thinking about the legislation in combating hate speech, what are some of the challenges that we face in actually defining what hate speech is? So one of the things that I've been doing is I've been looking at uh, what other countries have done. So many people point to Australia as having passed some pretty strict laws on this subject. Now their law is on abhorrent, violent material. So it's actually a very narrow subset. So it's, uh, if you go into the actual text, it says somebody murders somebody, somebody rapes somebody, tortures somebody, and then shows it. So it's, it's like, it's not all hate. It's a very specific kind, and the way you think about it is you think what happened in Christchurch in New Zealand, which was a trigger to this, and it's like you take that incident, and how do we prevent that from happening, and make it a little bigger, right? Because they are, they are, nobody was torturing, they were just killing, uh, and so on. So you just sort of broaden it a little. So that's the Australian example. Uh, the German example, on the other hand, which is again a very broad-ranging and it has actually had enormous impact on, on companies and on, on the way material is presented in Germany, is about manifestly, manifestly illegal content. So that's a much broader definition. So for example, you could have say, you know, Nazi stuff and so on. If, they are, if it's against their laws, that would be, would, would be covered by that law. Uh, <coughs> I think what you have somewhere in the middle which is broad but actually narrow would be the ICCPR definition. Now, unfortunately, ICCPR, I don't think we have convicted anybody on ICCPR, but it has become a word that people know. Now, I started talking about ICCPR last year. Uh, uh, I'm saying, OK, we got a, got a, got a law here. Uh, for wrong reasons, we are talking about it now. But what that says, interestingly, is it talks about groups of people, so it has to be religious, ethnic, etc., and words or statements that incite violence. A lot of our people, including the police and perhaps even some members of our judiciary, don't seem to have understood this word incitement to, to violence. That's, right. That's a very important clause in that. So, if you see the distinction between Christchurch-like right. activities, some people are murdering people, left and right, and live streaming it. That's not inciting to violence, that's actually engaging in violence. This one is about inciting to violence. If I could just switch to you, I don't, I don't want to start on the technical aspects as much before uh, we talk mm -hmm. about a few other things, but just in where we were waiting, we were discussing this incitement to violence and a will to do something. You were talking about this and how difficult it is to sort of, uh, not in the offline world, but how to detect it in the online world. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so firstly, you have to un understand that there are millions of posts that go up and you can't really, you can't realistically have humans sitting there and looking at every single post that comes out. The only way that becomes practically feasible is if you take a content platform like Facebook and you introduce some sort of peer review mechanism where every user checks another user. So face or Facebook would end up hiring 50% of its user base to check the other half. So what you have to do is move on to computational analysis. 
now the problem with computational analysis in our context is that what you can do with English and what you can do with Sinhala and Tamil in terms of actually analyzing it are leagues apart because English has had decades of investment. So you will have tools that are fantastically good at say detecting this kind of, you can take um, a provision, you can take a, f a framework, you can say, uh, you might take say incitement to violence against these classes, look for this kind of stuff. In Singular you can't do that. You won't actually be able to analyze because we need a lot of uh, in technical territory, but we need fundamental resources like corpuses. We need a whole lot of research built up before you can actually have programs running around digging for this stuff. The problem with, say, platforms like Facebook now, we often tell them, you know, you need to get rid of this stuff, on, uh, you need to remove this stuff. The problem is that they're used to working in English and they're used to working in languages that English has similarity with, say, West Germanic languages. When it comes to our languages, we are Indo-Aryan lang languages with completely different language structures. Now, one of Facebook's specific uh, criteria for looking at hate speech is to detect specificity of a future threat. Like, let's take the incitement to violence thing. Incite to incitement to violence, there's an aspect of the future to it. I want, I will, you know, I encourage you to kill X members of X protected group at this time or at this day, Facebook looks for that specificity. It's mentioned in the hate speech uh, detection protocol. But if you take the single language, we actually don't have a future tense. We have atita and anatita. So you have, say, a bunch of algorithms, a uh, bunch of programs, um, software, designed to detect this future event in English. You try to port that over to Singhala, you're going to end up with a whole lot of issues. So we tried. We, da we have now looked at 220,000 Facebook posts, that's well over a million words, trying to understand what exactly we can do with this. There's some very rudimentary topic modeling stuff that, re that still requires large numbers of humans sitting in front of it, trying to make sense of it, trying to understand what this means. Um, for example, if you take the word thambi, um, a Tamil man saying the word thambi to another Tamil man, it's a sign of endearment. It's, it's, a, it's a word younger brother. Me saying it to someone would be unacceptable. That's an insult. Now, for a program to identify that, it needs to know the ethnicities of the people involved in the conversation. It also needs to know whether we are friends. I could be friends, or I could be best friends, and we could be using this as a term of endearment amongst each other. I could have been provisionally accepted into that community. So all of these nuances have to be dug out for actual understanding, for actual detection, and to actually remove this problem. And it that's something we haven't solved it yet. It seems like almost an impossible task with all these nuances <coughs> that have to be thought It's about. a thing where you can have, say, a machine solution that takes you to 70%, mm -hmm. and you need humans sitting in for the other 30%, because hate constantly mutates. Um, you can say, for example, um, you can describe it as like a four-dimensional construct that mutates based on the the three axes of where it's at and the time it's spoken at, meanings of words change. You have linguistic drift coming in. And sometimes if you, say, ban a particular word, say you ban the word Nazi, people would readily adopt another symbol to denote that same concept and go on using that. We've seen this in China, for example, where President Xi Jinping, mm. yes, has been insulted and those insults are blocked. So people started using images of Winnie the Pooh to refer to the president, and then that then was that also blocked. blocked. <laughs> and then now they're going to evolve around it again. So, <coughs> so moving on to thinking about now, we talked about the, def the challenges in the definition, but thinking about, do we need legislation to address hate speech, whether it's you know particularly online that we're talking about? But there's two schools of thought. Am I right in terms of some people say no, we don't necessarily need new legislation. Existing, we have the existing mechanisms like you know provisions in the Constitution, the Penal Code. You mentioned the ICC uh, PR, but we're not enforcing it properly. Versus another group that says no, we do need new legislation because we're dealing with something new in terms of technology as well. Uh, if I could start with you, Professor, what are your thoughts on this? Well, uh, I don't buy the thesis. You know, that's embodied in that uh, nursery rhyme. Sticks and stones may break my bones, right, but words mere words, uh, yeah, words, mere words, words do. Mere words can kill. I, I have to yeah. accept that. There was a time when I used to believe the nursery rhyme, but I don't anymore. <laughs> uh, so words do matter, right? Uh, the question then is, if words do matter, 
what can be done about it? Now the question is words do matter, words on paper, words spoken over radio, Rwanda, uh, the genocide in Ru Rwanda, yes. uh, television, uh, online. What's the difference? So if you look at the ICCPR formulation, it's uh, technology neutral, platform neutral, whatever platform it is. If I say it in a public uh, rally, if I say it uh, on WhatsApp, I mean, I think some of the first arrests that were made uh, on the, under the ICCPR was after the Digana incidents in 2018. Mm. And these were some teenage uh, males. Running a WhatsApp group. Running a WhatsApp group. Yeah. And WhatsApp is end-to-end -end encrypted. So it's somebody who was at the other end who got it and who went and complained. And they said, this is an incitement to violence. Um, so I would say your starting question has to be that it has to be technology neutral. But then people tell me that uh, the new media, social media, is fundamentally different from the other media. Why? Because the other media had choke points. Editors, people who decided mm. this went, this didn't go. Publishers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Choke, point, choke points, and a choke point allows for regulation, allows for assignment of responsibility. That this is basically the key word is. In a way, social media doesn't tell us the story. It's user-generated content. Millions of people are watching or reading, and millions of people are producing and, and, and publishing, both at the same time. So if you don't have a choke point, how, how, what do you do is the question. And then the question is, well, you can say, well, but you know, they're, they're just communicating to two or three other people. Like, you know, we are all communicating without any, any, any editors, right, uh, in our everyday life. But they say, oh, hang on. There are some Facebook groups in this country that have way bigger membership than a large number of our newspapers, right? Yeah. So how can we say that that is insignificant if we say that the newspapers are significant? That's a, a major issue. So one has to be un one has to understand the technologies, like I said, distinguish between WhatsApp and Facebook and YouTube and, and so on. There's no generic social media. There are different kinds of yeah. platforms, each with its own qualities. Yeah. And then we have to think about these, these technical capabilities that they allow. We have to do both. Uh, I didn't say what kind of law we want, but I think ICCPR kind of technology neutral is good. And beyond that, we need to to look at the nuances. So before I turn to you for your response, we need to go for a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show. We're in the process of talking about uh, hate speech on social media with Professor Samar Jeeva and uh, Yudanja. Yudanja, we stopped off with you in talking about um, putting across legislation, whether we need new legislation to tackle this, these new technologies that have emerged, or do you think the existing mechanisms are sufficient that they just need to be enforced properly? So, well, I, I mean, I have very strong opinions about the current enforcement of ICCPR, which is used to harass writers instead of people actually generating uh, hate speech. But that aside, from a theoretical point, there's always been this problem of applying what we call meat space law onto cyberspace. So meat space, that is the space that we inhabit. There's a physicality to it. And there is the, where there is physicality, there is the implied threat of violence. So for example, as Prof mentioned, there are choke points, editors, where there are editors, there is some liability, there is a financial instrument, there is someone who will bear the burden of responsibility. And if he doesn't, you can inflict violence on the man, throw him in jail, and electrocute him or whatever you do. So the problem with cyberspace is that it allows you to detach your identity and form an entirely different identity to what you actually inhabit in the meat space world. And even anonymous. Yes, you can. Anonymity right? is the big problem. The problem is that if we can link a cyberspace identity to a meat space identity, then we can impose ICCPR or any number of rules and regulations that we have. The problem is that link. So that comes down to the platform. I don't think governments really 
I mean, I don't think it's practically possible for, say, the Sri Lankan government to pass a piece of legislature saying all Sri Lankan citizens must use their real name and ID on Facebook. You have to be real so you can be traced back. Facebook is going to go, no, we, you know, we have, we have entire communities where they value their... But they have a real name policy. They do, they do, but they don't, but that is often met with backlash, particularly from rights activists who go, no, we have the right to be anonymous on this. Uh, we have the right because in, in many countries, uh, anonymity allows you a measure of protection. There are countries, particularly we saw this in Myanmar, where uh, when we spoke to people who are using uh, Facebook, who are using Facebook to communicate with other clans that, and social structures that they would not have been a part of, they were very careful to disguise their identity because there are so many ethnic tensions and lines and they don't want any of those discussions being traced back to their family. It's not a case of the government intervening. It's a case of my neighbor could potentially come over and a guy on the other side of the mountain could come over and kill me. So Facebook, that comes down to the platform. Now in Facebook's case, they insist, yes, we want real names. That is an identifiable link. That is where we need that extra bit of legislation that has to come from both the platforms and the governments working together. I don't see a practical way for any single government or the platform to pull this off. There yeah. have been some incidents, though, have there not, where people have posted, I cannot recall the specific incident, but I remember reading where people have been questioned or you know, uh, brought to law enforcement because of some postings on social media? There have been. That those, are, those are incidents that are traceable. How many other incidents exist where people have said plain all sorts of manner of remorseless things and absolutely not being traced or can't be traced at all? If I were to change my name today on Facebook and go about posting stuff, how is anyone going to trace me? Uh, professor, from a, I mean, you're working in a government agency. Your perspective on this in terms of monitoring people, you know, th what they say on Facebook and whether they should be, um, you know, prosecuted even? What's your perspective well, you on see, government's role, basically? We, we don't have any, uh, my organization doesn't have any formal authority mm -hmm. on content on information, what is to be shown, what is not. We are not under the media ministry, we are not the telecom regulatory agency, we are none of those things. We have a function of almost being like an internal think tank for the government. When complex issues, particularly new cutting edge technologies come, it's our duty to provide the, the thinking for the government. And I think that's an essential feature. I think all governments should have that. Are we good enough? That's another question. I'm trying to do better, right? Uh, so then the question is, uh, when these issues c come up, now the interesting thing is, I was invited to discuss these issues 2018. The first piece of work that I did was analyzing the uh, Malaysian uh, fake news law, yeah. and that was before Mahathir won the election. So that's a long time ago, right? Um, so uh, so I in a way, the government has been thinking in its own disjointed fashion, the government has been trying to address these issues. Now the interest has just accelerated. So a do lot. they come to your agency for the input now on things like addressing hate They speech? do. So I get invited to these various places, sectoral committees and so on, and, 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 and people ask questions right. and they listen. And of course, this is a very interesting question that you brought up. So, I'll to, so, so I would agree, I mean, you could describe me even as a libertarian, mm. Mm, that's really up to somebody else to, to decide. I'm generally about, you know, people free to live their own lives their own way, unless they do serious harm. Now, unless do, they do serious harm, serious harm happens when people's property is burnt and people are killed, right? Uh, when you're praying in a mosque and somebody comes and kills you, when you're worshipping at the Sri Mahabodhi and somebody shoots you, these are serious harms, right? So we can't allow that. We, we have to have some precautions as a society against that. So I'm no, uh, you know, uh, pure libertarians will now say, ah, he's gone into government and he's now a bad guy. No, no, I have always felt that this is important. So now the question is content. Very difficult issue. Freedom of speech is very important, uh, just for, for, for a democratic society, but for any society. I mean, I can't imagine living in a society where I had to watch every word, right? But then the question is, if this is too difficult, people are asking, people are seriously asking, if we can get that link between the person 
and the speech. But if I the could accountability. Inter interrupt you just what uh, Yudanji said about <coughs> anonymity. Sometimes anonymity is important, as you mentioned, right? It is. And what's your perception right. on that? There are times when <coughs> people may need to be It's honest. a tough, tough it, question. It's no, obviously, there's no I mean, perfect answer. I don't think there's, uh, I think that's an uh, intellectual conundrum that hasn't been solved yet. You will always have platforms, and the, the problem is if one platform takes away anonymity and promises the government the link and says this happens, you will have another platform popping up almost instantaneously, and those users will migrate over to something else. But, but what happens is, you see, I'm old enough to have actually used bulletin boards, <laughs> right? <laughs> Almost <laughs> the, the early prehistory of of the internet, right? And I was you probably have not. <laughs> I, I, I know I have, but oh, you know, good. but <laughs> as an experiment too, <laughs> as an archaeologist, really, not in, yeah, yeah, not in my time. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I mean, I can remember there was uh, late eighties, perhaps somewhere there, right? Uh, there was this uh, groups, uh, bulletin boards, hmm. discussion groups. Sri Lankans living in the United States, uh, Sri Lankans living abroad. And remember, I mean, this was before uh, Chandrika had sort of mm, proved that peace could be a viable platform mm. uh, in the southern election and so on. So, you know, uh, intense feelings. And anybody who spoke in favor of some conciliatory solution was smashed into pulp on these things by anonymous people. Yeah. It's almost like, so I was watching this and it was sickening. I mean, if you open this thing yeah. in the morning, your whole day is ruined uh, because of the vitriol in, in it. So I stopped uh, participating and I sort of went to more curated groups yeah. after that. So one of the issues I have thought is, you see, anonymity for the most part causes people to behave irresponsibly and viciously. So let's, let's look at the, the, the trade-offs, right? The trade-offs are that we have to have enormous controls on speech on one side because we want to allow a few people to have anonymity. Yeah. But on the other hand, if we can make a trade-off, policy is about making trade-offs, then if we have accountability, my analogy is SIM cards being registered. There are some people, some of my colleagues, international colleagues, who violently disagree with me. I have consistently said it is okay to have SIM cards that are registered because a SIM card is like a car. Car can do wonderful things. It can get you to hospital when you've got a heart attack. It can run you down like Adeline Vitarna was run over. Now I'm really exhibiting my age. This was a 1950s murder, a very famous Vilpattu murder, right? D killed by driving a car over this person, right? So a car can do good and bad. A phone can do good and bad. We, do we go in and, and listen to every conversation in order to see whether it's good or bad? No, we don't. But we have that accountability link which says a SIM has to be registered to a real person. A car has to be re registered to a real person. We don't allow anonymous cars to go around on our roads. In the same way, I think social media or but these I'm kinds of media should also be like practically, that. Practically, like to be perfectly practical about this, there's no way this can be pulled off because this would have to be architected right into the early days of the web. You know, this has to be, this, this kind of government consensus on this issue had to have existed way back then when the internet was really being built. And that, that ship has really sailed. Like there's no way that we can guarantee, and for example, if you pass this law on Facebook and say Facebook agrees, I'm just going to shift to Twitter. If Twitter agrees, I'm going to shift to Signal or WhatsApp or any number of other platforms. It's, it's, this, is an Im this is an impossible target. But then there are people like me. I always tweet under my real name on, on No, true. I, 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 use, I, I follow use, real I use my real name real as well. I use my real Facebook. name as well. But I'm pointing out that if I want to be anonymous, and there are platforms on which I am anonymous, you can't stop me. Any amount of government policy, and I acknowledge. So why can't we have both living together? So, we so here are these places where there's sort of more flexibility with regard to content because people are accountable, because they're connected, cyberspace yeah. is connected to meat space. Yeah. Here are these places, sort of the wild west, the, the, the old bulletin boards, the nasty places, where God knows what will happen and the, 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 the yeah. enforcement, the so legal stuff will also be heavy duty. What if it's not necessarily, quote unquote, nasty locations, but uh, legitimate <coughs> reasons, say for example, human rights purposes, for example, or journalists who so may need to be anonymous for so certain justifiable reasons. we can use the analogy of the dark web here. 
because there's generally what you see of the internet is about 10% of the actual internet. There's a lot of stuff underneath. And it's common to paint the dark web as a bad place full of hackers and assassins. And yes, there are all sorts of horrible people in there. There are also people like human rights lawyers who want secure communication channels. We, for example, in the social media blog, I was using Tor and the dark web to get around the government doing stuff. And there are all sorts of valid reasons to be using that. And it is acknowledged that the, prob the problem with that anonymous space is also this. Say, for example, you have a Facebook, a safe space where everyone's connected, and you also have a dark web where anything goes, really. And it's also acknowledged that the law enforcement pointed at that is a really big, heavy cannon. Uh, the question is, how are you going to hit anything with that cannon? But they did catch people on dark web. They have. They have. They have. So, let them concentrate their energy on that stuff. If they want to catch somebody, go catch them without harassing everybody. So millions on this side. So what's to prevent me from, say, <coughs> impersonating you on this safe space and still doing my stuff anyway, knowing that the cannon is not pointed at me? And anymore. somebody, the cannon will be pointed at me. Poor me. Exactly. Whatever I'm doing. Exactly. <laughs> my own yeah. life. So you, yeah. <laughs> so I can set up a profile right now using your public data, impersonate you down to a T. Oh, that sounds like hate speech. We do have to go for a quick <laughs> break. We'll, we'll continue this discussion in just a short while. <laughs> Welcome back to our discussion on hate speech uh, on social media. Uh, moving on, we've been talking about anonymity, the need for it at times, and how do we address mm. that problem. Uh, I'd like to move on to the technical aspects now in terms sure. of the challenges that we face in monitoring, regulating, and addressing the problem of hate speech, uh, particularly on social media. Yudanji, I want to start with you. You might have seen on the news uh, in recent couple of days where Twitter has announced recently that they will be implementing a new layer, if you will, to tweets of uh, prominent government officials. Did I wonder yeah, if you saw that yeah, news item, where they will flag certain problematic content on Twitter um, coming from you know prominent uh, government but officials. But it's, it's also Twitter, so right, which is not too effective in Sri Lanka. Of salt. But what what are your thoughts on that? Isn't that also you know, in the realm of restricting speech to a certain extent. While they're not taking it down necessarily, it's still... I mean, I'm, I'm actually fine with them doing it. Because mm -hmm. we take, so this whole freedom of speech argument, <coughs> that is generally a right given to citizens by the government. Twitter and Facebook are private organizations with private spaces. And given this whole problem, now, for example, establishing identity, which I don't think is practical at all. I mean, governments will try, but I really don't think this can be done. Given that, then the only solution, if you don't want hate speech in our faces, is to take that off. Now, the problem, the real minefield here is, particularly in our countries, particularly in South Asia, particularly in Sri Lanka, a lot of politicians actually spew hate speech. Hate speech, particularly racism, are intrinsically part of the politics of this region, and they have been, if you read the Mahavamsa, that's, we, we, we've been doing this stuff for 2,000 years, right? So the question is, where does a, platf a platform start regulating hate speech and where does it where does it cross from that line into sort of regulating the politics of another country which is where which is sort of the ethical dilemma that a, a lot of these platforms really have to think about it's not as clear cut in our regions in the US you can take a president up to task uh, you can sort of hammer away at him uh, for saying x y and z things here no if Twitter or Facebook, for example, tries to censor a particular prominent politician based on what he says, this politician might be, say, leading the country right now. But that would be taken. That would be taken as an instrument of potentially the U.S. government trying to interfere with the politics of Sri Lanka, and then that's a whole diplomatic can of worms. Um, so, in in terms of the technical, in terms of once you get past that layer, once you get past the ethics, ethics and the rules and the frameworks, you have the problem of language itself. If you take Sinhala and if you take Tamil, they are completely unlike the English language. Uh, the English, English language is West Germanic. Uh, it shares connections with, say, Dutch, German, Afrikaans to an extent. extent. Sinhala and Tamil are indo aryan languages. The language structure is completely different. And we've tried this. Once the uh, 2018 block happened, 
we downloaded 60,000 Facebook posts first to see if the block was effective. Newsflash, it wasn't. But then we tried analyzing these posts to see what we can find. them, And we found that even the most basic algorithms that you could run to extract topics and so on perform completely differently in Sinhala as opposed to English. And that comes down to, say, for example, that, that uh, example I gave of Sinhala not having a future tense. You, a lot of the algorithms, a lot of the research, a lot of the work done is firmly in English. For Sinhala and Tamil to get to that level, to even where Facebook and Twitter and all these tech giants can do it, you need to have corpuses. You need to have fundamental research. You need to have tokenizers, lemmatizers. And there's a lot of research researchers, I would say, in Sri Lanka focusing on these things. But we are not at that level yet. Largely in the University of Morto and Colombo in particular, they're working in little cells, reinventing the same wheel. They're not at the level where someone can write a piece of Python code drawn in a library and accurately analyze Singhala. We're just not there. Third option is to translate content into English and then analyze the English and say, does this thing have hate speech? Say, for example, if you tweet in Singhala, I have something running that translates it to really good English. I know my algorithms for English are decent. And then I can make a judgment. I can make an automated judgment on whether your thing is hate speech or not, flag it, and send you back. The problem there is that piece of tech, in particular, has to come from the platforms. Because you need vast amounts of what we call parallel corpuses, say 10 million words in Singhala, translated into English, and perfect parity between them, so a machine learning algorithm can pick up on the differences and do an OK translation. We don't have that data. Uh, I want to um, switch slightly into talking about some of the things that we have uh, witnessed recently. You spoke about the blog not, block not being effective. Yeah. I'd like to know what your thoughts are. Do you think the social media block that the government imposed in recent times, was it effective, do you think? Oh, well, there were four. Right. Do you think right. any of them or all so, of them were effective? So the first one was back in 2018. Right. And then there were three of varying durations in 2019. Uh, I wrote uh, a piece, an op-ed in the New York Times back in 2018, where I said, you know, I mean, this is like too long. and. They should know when to, to cut it off. Was, how, which one you referred to? How, how 2018, long it went for about seven days yeah, or a week or so. More, yeah? Yeah, yeah, almost uh, a week. Uh, the reason is that, you see, I'm not, a, I'm not an absolutist. I mean, absolutist is, uh, I could say. I was actually lucky. I was out of the country at that time. So I wasn't actually affected by the block. Uh, but the question is, I mean, I didn't see the, I didn't see the logic of blocking these things. And, and, and there was a little twist to this, which is in many countries, like Ethiopia recently, <laughs> Uh, India all the time, Rajasthan in particular, they just knock out the internet altogether. So when you knock out the internet altogether, obviously social media goes. Sri Lanka was novel because we were actually not that nasty. We let the internet be and we knocked out only social media and then not the not press. All not all social media right. either. Twitter was left completely Except untouched. for the last yes. round, for the last last. Except round. quite recently, yes. a lot of platforms were left uh, out. Except yes. for the fourth iteration. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I mean, that's sort of, uh, what happened, I think, was that it was unusual because Facebook was being shut down in Rajasthan all the time, except they didn't say it was a Facebook shutdown, it was an internet shutdown. So, Kara Swisher and all these pontificators never got on this thing. But here, because of the enmity that old media, including yours, has towards new media, it's always attractive when the new media gets beaten up for the old media to cover it. It's not a disinterested story here. But this is I about economic would, survival. I would slightly disagree <laughs> that we do make very good well, use of social, you media, social media. You are individually. No, but I mean, there is no the difference. News, I news disagree with this difference of old media and new media. Mm. I think it's all blended. media are playing the same game right now, particularly, say, this TV station that you're in, you have a Facebook page. Yep. You have people with Facebook profiles that disseminates information. It's pretty much yeah, the same. Yeah, advertising. Uh, yeah, no, walking off with most of the advertising money. <coughs> they use that they would be using advertising on new media to so-called new media to spread word of their content and then get the same eyeballs that they then use to pitch advertisers. So um, we looked at when the 2018 block happened, we got 60,000 posts around the time of the block, and we looked at. So we were looking at particular groups, some of the largest groups in Sri Lanka. We are talking above 50,000 usage. And what we found out was that within 24 hours-ish, 
the people who were posting, we don't know about the people watching, but the people who were posting, roughly about 70% of them were right back at it. In fact, there was a little bit of an activity spike just before the blocks. So I would say they actually went back to their normal average levels of conversation for month on month on end. The only time when post activity dipped, that is people are not creating content on Facebook, was during the Sri Lanka Bangladesh cricket <laughs> match. So I would say if you want to <laughs> control hate speech, have more cricket matches, <laughs> right? <laughs> Blocks don't, and we, this time, we looked at 220,000 posts, much larger sample, exact same patterns. We looked at people using, people using Google searches, and we found that the, word, the usage of the word VPN skyrockets every single time that this stuff is down. Now, that's a problem. Because when you try to collectively punish a nation by taking away social media, people will go on Google Play, type VPN, get the first thing that they see. 90% of the time, that's going to be a cheap, fake app that's going to steal your data. So now what happens, the effect of these blocks is to put the, net, put the cybersecurity of the entire nation at risk. And my point is, you know, we have, we have had wars, we've had Black July, we have put remorseless pieces of metal into people's bodies without having Facebook around. This is what I wrote in, the, in, in response to Kara Swisher's piece. We have done this stuff for a very long time without using Facebook. Sophisticated terrorist operations are not carried out by someone putting up a Facebook status and saying, oh my god, I'm going to bomb someone today. That's just ridiculous. Taking this away doesn't make a difference. Professor, specifically uh, when we, you talked about you know, VPNs and how we got around the Facebook uh, or the social media block, given that, don't you think it's not effective? Yeah, so let's go back to, to the first time, you just mm. said, right? And some people didn't know what VPNs was. They had to search for it on, on Google. But now we have a situation where 15, 20 miles in, inland of side roads in Kurunayagala, you have a little communication shops which have a little hand-painted sign that says VPN got ahead. Yeah. Right? So now it's sort of becoming normalized. The most number of searches for VPN came from the central province. Yeah. So when it becomes West normalized, province. what's the point? Yeah. Right? I mean, it's like uh, you got speed limits, but everybody's got ra radar detectors. Yeah. Right? Um, you know, it, it doesn't make any sense anymore. Uh, and. Uh, and I was kind of amused because I was sitting outside. I was in Europe at that time, back in last March. And I would see the president and the prime minister and various people. So yeah. they put a ban on this, all yeah. this stuff. And there, and there, uh, there Facebook yeah. posts yeah. like crazy. Yeah. I said, yeah, 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 what is that? Lead to the opposition. Everybody's tweeting. Everybody's yeah. tweeting. Right. Everybody's and, and putting Facebook. Facebook. What does yeah. that mean? So what this does is, now the people with access to technology or who are computer savvy, we are fine. It puts perfectly innocent, perfectly normal people who are, like my mom, for example, who uses Facebook mostly to message me and tell me not to smoke. It puts, it takes her offline. I'm generally fine with that. But if you look at the population of these people in Sri Lanka, that's not OK. We are performing collective punishment on a population which has done nothing. If, not, if anything, that's, I think that's illegal under the Geneva. And, <laughs> and, and I, I have another issue. I mean, uh, whatever said and done, there's a lot of business, small businesses, yeah. doing, yeah. Getting, living their life on this thing. Yeah. Right? I mean, suddenly, you've got all these cake stock, and you've got this and that, and you've got a raw yeah. materials. And you can't sell, because somebody has arbitrarily shut off your marketing yeah. channel, the only marketing channel that we yeah. have. And the problem is, when you use a VPN, you might appear from the south of France. You might appear from the US. So, we, and this actually happened. We spoke to business owners in Colombo, particularly in the tourism industry, that rely on ad spend on Facebook ads to keep their businesses running. Tourist industry was massively impacted by this. Most people will give you hard dollar figures on this because they can't find the people in Sri Lanka anymore. The person from Sri Lanka shows up from Iceland, so your advertising your advertising money just goes nowhere. It's like. Where's your, where's your audience? So this has been a very fascinating discussion, and I think we could go on for another <laughs> hour if we really had the time, which we don't. So I'd like to thank both of you, Professor Rohan Samarajiva and Yudan Chevijaratta, for joining us on for this very fascinating oh, talk. Thank you. Thanks for much. having us here. We'll be right back.
riveting stuff indeed, and we absolutely need to discuss more on this in a future program. Now, before I leave you, I want to bring to your attention a quote from an opinion piece written by Amelie Vijaysinger, who is a partner at the West End Law Center in the United Kingdom, who wrote his piece on the Daily Financial Times. Here he says, and I quote, Here in Sri Lanka, the response to recent communal riots was to temporarily ban social media. An extraordinary move, indeed. We should ask ourselves whether it was Facebook that caused the riots in 1915, the 1970s, the 1980s, or is it a convenient excuse to stifle criticism of the government's handling of the crisis and to ignore the root causes of these issues? It is often difficult to distinguish between speech that directly causes harmful views and speech that is indicative of certain views developing within society. Thank you for joining us. Let's get real next week. At the same time, I'm Mahesh Johnny. Good night.